Thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's a great pleasure to be part of this conference. And I would like to start this short overview with one question. And the question is, how does the future look like? And how will sustainable robots be part of our society? Now, this is a non-trivial question, because it's hard to see the future. And it's the question that is very important to develop these new robots. It is also a question that personally has uh, you know, kept me busy over the last 10, 15 years. And I had an artist draw up a vision of how this could look like here. So robots will be part. They will be interacting with our solar cells, with our buildings, with our cars. They will also 3D print and repair infrastructure. And they will also move between air and water. So they will be multimodal and like this operate in those complex environments. So this is tomorrow, but today already we have drones. But these drones are relatively simple, and they can basically do visual detection of you know, environments, do mapping tasks, maybe have some kind of AI-based services on top of the data. But the next generation of robots will be consisting of robots that can physically engage with the environment, that can interact, that can 3D print, that can manipulate, that can sample the environment. And so these are the typics, uh, the robots that we focus on in our laboratory of sustainability robotics. So basically developing minimal invasive robots for measuring and modifying the environment. The hypothesis is that if we are able to build those lifelike robots, we have better data, more data, cheaper data, and less risky operations compared to existing methods. And of course, if we want to do that, we have to solve questions on metamorphosis and multimodality, on autonomy, on construction principles, that um, each of those are different PhD theses that we are uh, working on. So one methodology of how we develop those robots, we call this physical artificial intelligence. And this is basically a method of co-evolving the body and the mind, so the materials the robotics, the controllers, all together to create those type of lifelike robots. So let me give you an example. So an example is this one here. And this is a robot that can fly inside of fire. So it's a firefighting drone that uses uh, aerogel materials, so extremely high insulating materials and lightweight materials that are integrated and co-evolved with the robotic operation, with the robot morphology, with the controllers and the sensing to enable this type of lifelike robots for extreme environments. Other examples besides the fire drone include robots that can do uh, sensor placement, robots that can biodegrade in the environment, robots that can do 3D printing, or robots that can do water health monitoring. So I'll now give you two examples of those, just to give you a bit of a flavor of this type of technologies. So what if we would have robots that would fly through the forest and deploy sensors in the environment. And those sensors would collect the data, allowing us to study climate change, study biodiversity, but then leaving zero environmental footprint. So biodegrading in the environment, having materials that are sustainable and non-invasive. So here you see a video of that. So we have developed various methods of how to place sensors with drones. And one of the methods includes these sensor launching drones that can basically fly, then detect a tree or a structure, map this in three dimensions, calculate the trajectory of the dart, and then shoot the dart to the tree with a precision of a few centimeters over a few meters distance. So it's a relatively precise method of placing those sensors at different heights, extremely quickly, and at low risk and cost compared to uh, other methods. So the, we have tested this in a forest here, in a Croatian forest, actually, where, off, where we want to know the biodiversity. We want to know what's happening in the forest. What are the animals that live there? And how are they changing because of climate change? So it flies, it can map, it can then place the sensor. And this sensor can have different type of sensing on it. One of the sensor signatures that we look at is bioacoustics. So it's uh, bird sounds that it records. And then we can use an AI algorithm called the bird net that identifies the species richness and the abundance of which birds are where in the canopy. So this is a quantified method of biodiversity mapping using autonomous AI-enabled robotic tools. 
So this is an example of how the future of ecology, the future of environmental sensing uh, will look like. Eventually, those sensors can be fully biodegradable and include humidity, temperature, or other kind of environmental sensors. Eventually, audio recording that will be fully biodegradable. So the whole field of um, uh, biodegradable electronics or transient electronics will really support us to enable this. And we have already built that. And we had a recent paper that came out a few weeks ago on a small glider that can fly and has biodegradable structures and sensors in it. To do that, we had to develop a new manufacturing method that you see here, which is using cryogel composites. So it's a freeze drying of those composite cellulose-based materials, allowing us to create those type of uh, porous structures that can also biodegrade over time. So it needs new innovation on the material front as well as on the robotics front as well. OK, second example is the idea to have 3D printing drones. Now imagine such a drone here would fly collectively with ground robots, with humans, and 3D print structures in space environments, but also on Earth, uh, in, you know, in the Arctic, in hard to access environments, and so on. And so I know that this looks a bit like science fiction, right? And I think it's a good thing. Robotics should be like that. But a lot of this we can already do today. And to do that, we reviewed different animals of how animals build. Because nature and humans, they build differently. And the philosophy of animal-inspired construction is different. It is decentralized. It uses multiple agents to work together and do the task allocation. And they are dynamic, adaptive, and redundant. Very different from how today's construction looks like. So this type of construction can really transform autonomous manufacturing, repair with robots, and interaction with the environment. So one robot example is this one here, which is a base platform that is autonomous. And it then stabilizes the extrusion head with a precision of a few millimeters. This is very precise, because the platform usually moves a little bit, even if it flies very stably. And so like this, we can extrude a high-performance cement material to make layers, and in this example, 3D print um, a structure as a proof of concept. So 27 layers showing that it is scalable, it works, this material can be used, and even that was also co-evolved with the robot itself. We can also think of more complex materials. So what if the material behavior is less predictable? Can we use polyurethane foam, so expanding foam, for example, to do the printing and then build the next layer. But of course, if the foam is behaving in a strange, unpredictable way, we need to also include a mapping step. So we have a scan drone that goes, scans the structures, creates those three-dimensional scans, and then identifies the next trajectory based on what it has built previously. Now, this is a bio-inspired approach. It's not an approach of blueprinting and trying to build everything according to uh, a centralized plan, but it is an adaptive method of printing, then scanning what it has printed, and then adjusting the next printing step. So it's a closed loop aerial additive manufacturing method where the sensing and the actuation are connected. And I think this is extremely powerful uh, framework for construction, manufacturing, repair with autonomous agents, and in this case, uh, um, aerial additive manufacturing. I mean, of course, it uses more than one robot to do that. I mean, we are stronger together, as in this conference. But also for robotics, it's like that. So they need to also work together, allocate the tasks, um, ma manage the task allocation dynamically as well, depending on what they have printed, and have these decentralized controllers that you see here to build up larger structures collectively over time in an adaptive manner. OK, so this work came out a couple of months ago. And I'm very happy about this, because it's also an example of how we had to co-evolve the materials with the robot, with the autonomy, with the controllers, all at the same time. So this physical AI as a manufacturing and developing method for those type of robots has been very important. The robot is currently exhibited um, at the Venice Architectural Biennale in uh, the Palazzo Bembo in Venice until November. So if you happen to be around, please drop by. But today. We have the pleasure of having the drone, its sister, 
So that's one is there. Its sister is here with us today. And it's exhibited also just for you. On the first floor, we have a stand. And you'll see here the delta arm. You see the autonomy sensor, the onboard computer, the base platform, all custom developed in our laboratory. So you can engage with us and, and look at these use cases and um, look at how we can create value together. OK, so coming back to sustainability, we need to work together. We need to innovate this new generation of robotics that is there on the market tomorrow. But we need to work on it today. And we need different environments where we can do that. We need laboratories, test beds, uh, communities to do this. And one of the test beds that we are building at the moment um, at the EMPA Material Science Institute in Zurich, next to Zurich, is called the Drone Hub. And the Drone Hub is exactly one of those platforms where we can work together and demonstrate those type of robotic solutions. So this, what you see here, is the nest building. And the nest building is a, scuff, is a skeleton structure where different units can be built in. And so the units are new innovations in building technologies. For example, one is made of wood, one is, has this curvature roof, double curvature roof. So it's new technologies that are between academia and between industrial adoption. So it's a test bed for new technologies. This, what you see here, is our uh, headquarters. So this is our, our offices. But next to it, there is an opportunity to have a new unit, a space where we can innovate a new building that allows us to test those type of robots. So we call this building the Drone Hub. And the Drone Hub will have three innovation elements. Number one is it will have a surface, so a side wall, where we can study autonomous scanning and repair with flying agents, as you see here. The second one is a biosphere, where we can study how drones can place sensors in natural environments, how drones can place and biodegrade, uh, place sensors and biodegrade. And the third is how they can interact with the facade to do non-destructive evaluation, mapping, solar cell, monitoring, and so on. So this drone hub is an opportunity to demonstrate this, again, from facades of how buildings need to change and be adaptive for that how we need to co-evolve the material science and the robotics together, and how we can advance the frontier of autonomous manufacturing by, in, by having multiple aerial agents that do that. And all of this coming together in a drone hub test bed for community building and uh, joint research. So I would like to thank the funders who have supported this gra gra uh, generously over the last 10, 15 years as well as the team who have uh, uh, led this with a lot, of, a lot of enthusiasm and joy, as well as um, the alumni who came out of the group uh, over the last 10 years who are now spinning off those types of ideas in their own research laboratories. So to end, I would like to emphasize that this is not about me. It's not about us only. It's about a sustainable, beautiful world that we want to create together. It's an opportunity to team up use the facilities we have in our rich countries, in our, uh, the gifts that have been given, and create a world that is sustainable and um, valuable for all. Thank you very much.